What's up everybody, welcome back to the channel. So today's video is a little bit different. I was recently contacted by students that were competing in the MET2 design competition and they had asked if I could spend some time with them going over their project and their models as well as assignments they've gotten in class and just learn a little bit more about my background. The video today is a portion of that interview. So I hope you enjoy it. If you do, please leave a like. Um, also subscribe to the channel so you can get the rest of the interviews that we'll be rolling out. If you have a question, leave a comment in the comment section and be happy to reply back to you. I hope you guys enjoy it and get some value out of it. Have a good week. Hello, my name is Josh and I'm an engineer with Forge Product Development. Forge helps clients start and grow their businesses by providing affordable access to effective engineering resources. Monday through Friday, we offer a free engineering helpline live on our social media platforms where we help answer questions from people just like you. The clips that follow were taken from one of those sessions. I hope you find it useful and enjoy. The ominous name, Scan of Block. It's gonna be like a little kid's toy. It's gonna haunt my dreams. Just a terrible mesh. <laughs> my computer's currently running SolidWorks and OBS and Skype, and it's just like, oh, a thousand faces? Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, so we're gonna hang out for a couple minutes while it loads. We'll check back in an hour. Oh man, that's ugly. More, more faces better. Actually, you know the funny part on STLs, like, especially if it's a machine part, you don't need that many faces. Right? Like, look at how many faces I actually, I mean, I'm picking, what, to do that whole meat press thingy was like, you know, 10 points or something like that. I mean, like, you don't need that many. You just need enough that you're confident that the point that you're selecting is on the surface, right? Because then you're, you're using all the reference geometry and all your background on how the part's made to determine where that line should be like we know it's horizontal to this plane we know it's going to revolve around here i only need one point to locate a line now and so as long as that scanner puts you one point on that plane like that's it you can you can model it off of really very few faces now if you guys are getting into like um okay for an example this right so i did the model for this there's nothing flat on this right so now you're doing what's called surface modeling because you can't use extrude or revolve or like you're doing all individual surfaces and netting it together. Um, but when they scanned this, like I needed enough points to pick up the curves on things. Um, so you need more points because now you have, you have a spline instead of a straight line. So a straight line, you only need two points. Now you have a spline, you need all the points along it to define it. So then you can crank up your uh, your fidelity, but yes, yeah. The guy who made this, or the guy who the client who did this, uh, made one out of wood because he was like a like craftsman or whatever, and he wanted to do the shaker hood. So he made one out of wood. They took it to a scan shop. The scan shop sent me the STL, and then I reverse engineered it from the STL so that they could make castings for it. So you mentioned scan shop. So there's places that will scan objects for you and yep. send you files. Yep, exactly. Um, when they send you a file, is it usually like filled, all the holes are taken care of, um, set up to nice soft planes and stuff like that? Yeah. Depending on who you go to. Um and honestly that's true. Uh so there's certain uh companies that will do all of that. They basically have like post processing as part of their package. So they'll scan it and then they give you like a really pretty model or not a model. Well some some places will model. Um but they'll go in and like clean everything up using their uh, mesh editing software and um and give you something that's clean. But sometimes, and depending on what your cost is or what your use case is, like I would almost rather, I would usually rather pay less for a model that hasn't been cleaned up. Um, that, like I said, is kind of like low quality, like has less faces than this. Um, because then like it's one, it's lightweight. And two, I'm not paying for something that I don't need. I don't need it to be airtight. I'm not trying to print from the STL. My job is to reverse engineer the STL, to reverse engineer the scan so that the part is accurate. And like sometimes if you, if you scan, say it's a machine part, right? And they take the scan and they fix it up and they make it watertight. 
and then you say, okay, well, I have a watertight model that's now solid. I'm going to go to manufacturing with this instead of taking in and remodeling over it. Your faces aren't, I mean, they're never going to be perfect from the scan, right? So now when you're going to machine that, now you have issues because it really needs to be rebuilt in a proper model. But there's people out there that like, um, they'll do like minifigures is really popular with 3D printing, right? You print like little characters or something like that. And there's places that will 3D scan a little figure or something like that. And then you can print it and that's good enough. But they might have to go back in and post process and like patch everything up. Here we go. Moment of truth. Ready? Assembly. Does it break? No, it's much bigger. As long as all the buttons are in the same folder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, how did you export it? Um, what do you mean? Like, did you like save as into another folder? Um, or did you just copy and paste it or like send to zip? Yeah, this one I copied all these files into one folder. Okay. Folder, and it's sent into a zip folder. Gotcha. So there's a tool in here. Um, uh, you go file, pack, and go. So, this will collect everything from everywhere and save it into a zip, zip file for you. And not only that, you can use it to rename files and stuff like that. Um, and it protects your references because it's basically SolidWorks' version of packing it into a zip file. And so if you've ever gotten an assembly from somebody and you go to open something, it's like, oh, this part's missing. And then it like grays it out or deletes it or suppresses it. This will prevent that. And you can actually, um, it'll look not only within uh, the folder that you're in, but it'll look to whatever the reference is. It'll follow that path, grab that part, bring it into the zip file for you, and then rename the path so that when you open it on the other end, um, this is a great way to save versions of things. So what I'll do is I'll say like, okay, I'll be working on a project and I'll be like, oh, I'm gonna make a big change, right? But I might wanna come back to this save as a zip file, put the date on it, and now you know, okay, I can open that up. Everything has been saved to it. Yeah. That is very good to know. Yeah, that's a good um, way to do it. I'm one of those save revisions kind of guys. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, there's no revisions here, right? Yeah. I've had some trouble with... Uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Because even if you do like a save as of an assembly, or the save as of a part, now that's a different part that needs to be brought into that assembly, or which one's the current one, pack and go, just save the entire thing as like a brand new project. If you wanna go back to it, you can open it up. It's all, you can rename, um, which I recommend you do. Uh, file, save as, pack and go. You can add a suffix. So say like you wanna make a rev like 01, right? Now every part in here will be saved into the zip file with a new suffix so that when you open the zip file, um, so SolidWorks will look for missing references, right? So if you name something the same thing, like, uh, it doesn't like that very much. no, cause it can go find it and then try and bring it in. And now bolt in this assembly that you named bolt in another assembly. Well, it found that other bolt and now it's going to try and bring it in. Right. So that can be part of the problem with it, yeah. So my naming convention is uh, all numbers. There is no metadata in, like you guys have like backplate, front right hole, right? If you look at something that I've done, so this is me, right? So I have assemblies, I have parts. There's no metadata here. These name, these file names will never change. So there's no, there's no revision of this file. There's only this file. And the only time I create revisions is when I either save out a pack and go into a zip file and create a revision that way, or if I'm creating a PDF or a step file or something that's inert, that's basically like a snapshot. So revisions to me are snapshots of whatever I'm doing. All right, so backplate. Is there a, is this an exploded view or this is everything's brought in separately? So we've got the main part, right? Cool. Oh yeah, cavity. Yeah, you guys are good, man. You're good. So yeah, this is designed to be a uh, forged carbon part uh, mold. Okay. Where, uh, 
kind of want like a piston effect from that that back plate to drive your resin carbon into the the cavity. Okay. And let the resin ooze out in that gap. See that like I think it's like twenty thou. Right here. Put all the way around it. Yep. Yeah. You want the resin to uh, be squeezed out through there, gotcha. and hopefully not through the party line in the mold. Um, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you guys look good there. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I'm, I, I'm actually have not done almost anything with composites, um, so I, I can't tell you like, oh yeah, the mold looks good or it doesn't look good. Um, from a mold perspective, your part's probably fine. Um, like draft would be the only. I didn't want to open that back plate. I wanted to open the part. Like. Yeah, I don't think Okay. You guys know how to you know how to check for draft? Yes, yeah. I okay. started using the bowl features. Yeah, there um, you go. Very cool stuff. Um very cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Um They always make a two card mold though. It mm -hmm. seems like. Yeah, you're good. Because I, I uh yeah, there's that one little thing that it depends on what your um what your process requires. Like, I think this is only one degree of draft, and that's three. So, like, you might only need one, maybe. Maybe you get away with it, maybe you don't. Either way, you're coming down perfectly tangent, right? Or you're, 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 yeah, that's what it is. Because when you're making this part, so we roll it back, right? Your walls are all square, right? And then when you're adding your fillet, you'll, you're never going to go, past tangency because it's probably protecting the bottom let's see how you applied it yeah top surface good so this is a good thing so you selected the face instead of all these little edges right and you could even select an edge and say like um it'll give you the sometimes it'll give you like the auto select option faces are more stable so select faces over ed edges for sure where possible um, so this is going to protect this bottom edge here. So you're never going to come down. Yeah. It's not perfectly tangent at the top though, right? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, but one cool thing you can do is, um, you can go into features and it, this, doesn't have to be done, obviously, and it might break your fillets. Um, but you can define direction of pull in here. And then, uh, so it'll add draft for you. I'll make it bigger so you can see it, but see how it cast that face back. So you can figure out whatever you want your minimum angle to draft to be, like if it's three or whatever, and then just use that draft tool to do all of those. Actually, an even cooler trick because it's only one extrusion. So this is good for like doing individual faces or um, parts where you can't do this next trip, but you can actually go into here and there's draft built into here. Yeah. And then just do that and it'll, draft it for you the version with the pens i um i think that's how i did that i yeah. tried using the uh the draft analysis and then adding a draft in mold tools and it all went to hell so i was mm. like you know it's true i went back to the extrusion and yeah um put a draft angle on it yeah um it's <clears throat> so getting back to you know, yeah uh, go ahead well, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Split a part into two pieces. Um, with the like, split command. Because it, it's really cool to use um the mold tools to to make the uh the solid bodies for the uh the mold, mm -hmm. a, a core and cavity, and um, but if we wanted more than two pieces, I've been putting them together, you know, myself. Mm -hmm. um, ah. You are you do, doing are you doing top down or bottom up modeling? Um, um so a top down method would be for mold making would be to bring your uh part into a file and then draw the mold around the part 
and then use Cavity to cut it out so that all the information for that assembly is in one spot. Bottom up is where you say, okay, I want my mold to be five by five, right? So then I'm gonna go draw a part that's two and a half inches, and then I'm gonna draw a part that's two and a half inches, and I'm gonna bring them into the assembly, and then they're gonna be like five by five, right? So are you modeling thing? Oh, actually, I can tell you right now. I'm gonna use the ladder method mm -hmm. on two pieces that add up to the dimension. Yeah, yeah, which makes sense, right? Because your back plate is your first piece in this assembly. So what I would probably do is, or something to look at going forward or to research on your own um, is a method called top-down modeling. And it's what I do pretty much exclusively um, whenever there's more than one part. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna make an assembly. This is gonna be a really abbreviated version, but you're gonna make an assembly and you're gonna import the part that you want. Um, like the main part that you want to make the mold out of. And now what we're going to do is we're going to make a new part within the assembly. Now there's a whole like skeleton sketch technique and there's like, there's a lot of depth here that um, is worth learning over time as far as like how to create this to be stable and whatnot. But just to kind of answer your question, I'd probably do something like this. And then you wanted what? You wanted like three pieces, right? Yeah. Um, so within here, where is the main body? Okay, so we can use those planes. Use front and right. So we're gonna split the part. Uh, feature, I believe it's in surfaces. Split is what you're looking for. And your tool is what you wanna use to split. And you can do it a couple different ways. You can use two tools at the same time cut part, and now it's dividing that block into four pieces using these planes to define how it's split up. And we want to, we'll keep all of them. All right, and then we can use combine to add the bottom back together, add, all right? And then we can use, actually, before we do this, we're gonna use, cavity and we'll cut the part in. Now we'll split. And now if you remove this. So now you have three different pieces, right? Um, with the cavity in it, but it's all within one part file. So that's one way to do it. You could this actually, this, I mean, this, this could take, I could walk through this for an hour on how to properly do top down. Um, this is, this isn't even the way that I would like recommend doing it if you were really looking for stability, but for, for this, it's fine. Um, but then you can go in here and you can do things like, I'm trying to remember where it is cause I don't usually use this. Save bodies, right? And you can select all of these. Oh, it's because I haven't saved the original part. Um, yeah, got it. Um, but you can select these bodies now that exist and you can save them out into their own individual part files, right? So then when you open up the assembly and you make any change to the whole mold as itself within as its own part, um, those changes will be pushed to the individual components of the mold in their own body file or in their own part files. So now you're, that's a little bit of a glimpse in the top down where you're um, building 
parts within assemblies to then get like saved out. And that's how you build mechanisms, right? There's no way you could do like a three bar link. I mean, you could, but you're no, you're no, there's no way you're doing advanced mechanisms. Like, okay, so the gearbox and all the pieces inside this reel, right? So there's dozens of pieces in here. There's no way to know all the dimensions and model the part and then put it in here. You have to build a sketch. Uh, yeah, I'll show you real quick. So the way that this is built, and this is why you build things lightweight, right? Like this has 52 components in it and it loaded fairly quickly. But if you don't build it the right way, you open 52 component files and it just like you chug, you can't even like rotate it because it's trying to solve all the things. But the way that this is created is actually from a reference sketch. Each of these parts is getting information from an exterior sketch. And I think I did this the wrong way. Yeah, so even I've even changed the way that I've done it um, since doing this reel, which was a couple of years ago. But if you'll see, so like this sketch is called gear side, right? It's giving me this look at the side of the gears. Now I have a cone. This is another sketch that defines all the geometry in here. Gears front. So it's the same gears gear train just from a different view. And so that's how you're building the relationships um, between parts so that when you go to model the part, all you're really doing is you're going in and you're referencing the exterior sketch, which is like the master sketch basically. And then you're building your parts and you know everything fits because you designed it all as one thing as opposed to trying to like define, designing a gear and then you bring it in and then you design something else and then you bring it in. Because the power of SOLIDWORKS is being able to build the relationships between things. So if I change the size of this gear, the other one updates for like the ratio or maybe I make a shim bigger. Everything changes on that whole um, shaft so that it fits now, right? And that's what you're trying to build. That's top down modeling methods, but something that could be its own call in, in and of itself. No, that block of doom, man. I tell you what, you know, the funny part of the about the block of doom is it's no more complex than this thing right here. The scan is just a bear. So what I would do for those texts in the like the elephant, I'd go find a vector image of an elephant or I'd go and like trace it out or something like that using a, a normal editing software. If you go into a part, you can select a plane. And then you go insert and you do DXF. This is what I do all the time. I use Inkscape, which is like a vector editing image tool, right? And I'll take fonts and people's logos and stuff like that. And I'll just save it as a DXF from that file and then bring it into here and drop it in and you can just scale it and apply it to the side of the thing. You don't even have to model it in SolidWorks. You're not gonna draw an elephant in SolidWorks. You just go find a picture of an elephant and convert it to DXF, then drop it in as a, a reference and cut it like that that would be the way to do it like solidworks is good for stuff but drawing elephants is not one of them like, it's a 3d mouse the company is 3d connection c-o-n-n-e-x-i-o-n -N -E -I -I and this is a space mouse pro i would recommend they have um they have a couple different sizes of them they have one that's like just the the ball and i think it's got like two buttons on it which is fine. I like the one with the wrist support and that one, like the base models of those come with lots of buttons. And to me, the big advantage of using like the one with the buttons is that your hands don't have to go back and forth to the keyboard. Like I'll model all day and I'm never going like escape or shift and then move my model and then like S, S brings up hotkeys, right? So you can rebuild all of these windows. So what you do is you build your own windows within each thing and then you hotkey one of your keys on your mouse pad to S. And so I can like fly around the model and then I can like hit S and bring up my window and do my thing. And then you're not going to the bar and searching for it. Like it's all right here. And that's just like a speed efficiency thing. Doing that. I saw that speed challenge that you did. Mm -hmm. That is the secret sauce.